Today's guest is the author of several academic publications. She's the CEO of Multiple Voice LLC. She's a voice coach and is the host of Multiple Voices podcast. She's a former interpreter of the United States Department of State, Washington, D.C., and is currently a professor at the university in Italy. Welcome to the show, Claudia. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you, Toby. You said my name perfectly. Uh, that's <laughs> you, so are the, you are the first, the first host who says Claudia. <laughs> uh, that's, I, I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so, so much for, for joining me today on this episode. Thank you for having me. I'm, for having I'm, I'm, I'm just really excited to be speaking with you. Even before present record, like we've just been conversing and I just enjoy, you know, just speaking with you already. That's, that's been yeah, awesome. Yeah, yes. me too. Me too. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm an open book. We can, you know, really talk about anything. But yeah. um, as I was mentioning this I, what I really, really like is the title of your podcast, Mirror mm. Talk. I think that that's probably when, first of all, it's original, all right? You don't find Mirror in, in many podcasts. Mm. And then it, it's so interesting because it covers so many different fields, yes. you know, because when you talk about a mirror, you talk about how people see each other, how people see other people, how other people see them, yeah. how that changes as time goes on and in certain, I love it. I just love it. Wow. Congratulations. Thank, thank yeah. you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you so, so much. So, you know, you have, you have worked as an interpreter for the US Department of yes. State and yes. you're a professor, you're the CEO and you know, you're a podcast host. You have experienced a lot of things or you've done a lot of things yeah. so far. Yeah. So I'd love to learn more about that. Can you share more about your, your okay. life and career journey with me? Okay, okay. So, so let's say that, um, as you uh, said in the beginning when you were introducing me, most of the things, even if there's so many different things, they have a, a thread, a common thread, and it's always language. Mm -hmm. It's always to do with either speaking or uh, communicating, and it has to do with interpersonal relations. And my work at the um, in, in, in State Department was as an interpreter. And it, what in, what do they do? Interpreters usually um, are, let's say, a go between between two people who speak different languages. That's two people, but they can also be conference interpreters, where you sit in a booth generally and you listen to the um, to the message in one voice in one language and you speak in another that's simultaneous interpreting that's one of my favorite no that's what i teach actually mm -hmm. and um so so it's interesting i used to think um back when i was working a lot more as an interpreter i used to think oh my god this is getting boring i wish they knew what they were talking about at least you know <laughs> yeah yes. because you have to repeat people's thoughts sometimes that are just pitiful some you know mm. or they they just don't make any sense mm. they try to, they say okay there are four points in blah 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 and they say two mm. or three but never four yeah. you know so so you just go with the flow and sometimes you correct mm. but it's interesting it, it you, you learn a lot you really learn a lot yes. um but then i you got tired of doing that because i was always I had to interpret somebody else, uh, somebody, someone else's thoughts, yes. and um, it became, of course, easy and second nature. And um, it, it is something that there's a gift, just like any other profession. There are gifted doctors, gifted artists, mm -hmm. and uh, I, since I said that I teach interpreting, you can learn it, of course. Mm -hmm. And it's not about. It really isn't about the languages and how many languages and how well you know those languages. Really, it's about how delicate you are in understanding that social dance. Mm. Because when you're working, especially in politics, yeah. people don't want to be understood. They talk, but they don't want to be understood. And that's difficult. That's really, really difficult. So there are a lot of stories. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah a lot of stories there. But I'm quite but, I'm quite interested in this um, interpreter work that you did for a while. Um, can you tell me about, you know, the, the changing role of an interpreter, for example, and how does, you know, this self-preservation in simultaneous interpreting comes into play? Yeah, it, well, the, the role of the interpreter has changed so much, so much over the years. Um, well, over these last three years, just, mm. just simply because 
since COVID, we do not go to conferences mm -hmm. and we are always, I'd say 99% of the time behind a computer now. Mm -hmm. And so you can understand how difficult that is because we are in a conversation, Toby, and either you speak or I speak mm -hmm. because otherwise the people will hear two overlapping voices and they can't understand. So a lot of companies started working on that problem and created um, different channels and different platforms to be able to listen to the original, have people attend the conference, and uh, also for interpreters to work. And um, so, so that was partially solved. Uh, the role of the interpreter has changed also in a different way, because um, many times you are just not, you are not just an interpreter, but you are a confidant if you're in a, a liaison a situation where if you travel with the political delegate, you a delegate, you are their confidant in the sense that they need information from you before they go into meetings and they need to know from you the customs of certain countries, certain cities, certain people and certain political parties. Mm -hmm. Can I say this? Would I be offensive if, you know, so, so many of the times you're asked much, much more than uh, the, the language uh, uh, programs teach you, you know? Yeah, yes. And so, so that is, like I said, it's not all about the language. It's really about this social dance that's, that, um, that's difficult. And when you talk about self-preservation, um, this was a study I did a while ago. It's actually the basis for my PhD. Um, when you're talking, um, I mean, if I said to you, Toby, how dare you? How could how could you have such a podcast? You should be ashamed of yourself. That's a that's a threat, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's mean, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> that's something I, you know, people just don't say, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I really wanted to sugarcoat it, I could say something like, are you really sure that that's the right word, words to use to describe your podcast, couldn't you probably have found a title that could have been more conducive or, you know, I could have changed it in a different yes, way. So yes. what happens in politics, especially, but in general, all every day, is that people talk to each other. And mm -hmm. when I said before, they really don't want to be understood. That's true. And when there is an interpreter between two people, they use the interpreter to mm -hmm. say really mean things hmm. tell him to go to hell <laughs> hmm. i like hell i will do that you know and tell him those words tell him those words you know and yeah. it's terrible yes. um so what i did was a, a survey oh i took uh, some data from a conference where uh, there are professional interpreters and there are situations i'll give you an example there was an israeli this was a conference on women uh, politicians in the mediterranean hmm. and uh, an Israeli delegate uh, delegate stood and it was her turn to speak because they had to talk about the situation of women in their area and what they were doing or how it has changed recently. Mm -hmm. She got up and she started saying in English, she said, um, please forgive me. I have a sore throat yesterday. I had a fever, but I will do my best. And as soon as she finished that, she turned and she said, I heard what you said yesterday. She was talking to, I, I think, another woman from um, another, uh, you know, rival country in that area. Yeah. Um, and and the interpreter who was working from English into Italian mm -hmm. had this little del del delicate set. You know, she didn't know what to say because she didn't understand. All of a sudden, she was, you know, saying, "I couldn't, I can't speak your language, and I have this." I had a fever, but I will do my best. And then attacking this other woman all of a sudden. Now, yeah. in English, you know, we say you. I heard what you say. Mm -hmm. I heard what you said. I heard. And you, you, you doesn't change. But in uh, Romance languages like French, Spanish, uh, Portuguese, and Italian, there is a formal way of saying you. The mm -hmm. Spanish is usted instead of, you know, uh, you and Italian as well. But it doesn't matter if there's a formal or informal, that's not the question because in a conference, if you point at someone, that's a threat. You single someone out in a crowd of 500, 
that is really something you don't do. Mm -hmm. So I looked at how the interpreter dealt with that. And in that, this is just an example, there were very many, but in that specific example, she turned and said, yesterday, I heard that there was a talk about Arafat and blah, blah, blah. And she took a distance from the words that the woman had said. And so what I found was that she was saving face instead of having a face threat, instead of threatening the woman, she moved away and made it passive. It was passive. I heard that people said. And similarly to this, this happens in language all the time. We all do. Uh, we do use the passive tense. And others, then I interviewed them and they said they would never make a threat as the original speaker has said. They all what we call mitigate, they all change it. Usually they could say something like, um, uh, the speaker said that, because when people are listening to you, they take you for the speaker. Mm. You know, they're listening to you. They don't understand. Many don't even believe that it's the you know, real person speaking. And that happened to me personally. It was a very difficult, very, very difficult situation I was in. Um, I had two delegates with me at the time, and uh, we were at this underground um, compound in the United States. And uh, it was, you know, top secret. We couldn't go in with any pens, papers. And of course, when you're working, you need pens and papers. And working with two people is very difficult because you're whispering. We had no booths. Mm -hmm. And one of, there were two different political parties. And they did not get along. Wow. And one of them in particular just kept speaking over me. What did you say? What did you say? And of course, when I heard him and I heard the speaker, I, I couldn't work, right? Mm. So that was the start of a terrible day. Yeah. Then we got into the big hall and you know, the, the general came in and talked about the compound. And the same delegate said to me, ask him how much money he makes. Mm. I looked at him. And especially, well, in the United States, you don't do that. You don't go and ask people direct questions like that. Yeah. What, who do you vote for? How much money do you make? You know, are you Jewish? You, you just don't do that. And of course, mm -hmm. that's, it's in many, it's, it's, there's, you know, social graces don't put you in a situation to do that. People avoid that, right? Yeah. And I said to him, you know, you just can't ask him how much money he makes. It's just not done. And I tried to tell him twice. He stands up, shouts, and said, how much money do you make? And in, in Italian, he mm. shouts and says, how much money do you make? Mm. I was, I could have, you know, gone underneath the ground. I didn't know where to turn. I was trying to hide and I couldn't. So I stood up and I found myself saying, the gentleman to my right would like to know your salary. <laughs> you know, so so it was him. It wasn't me. You know, yeah, yes. Because yes. we always talk in the first person, so that would have required me to stand up and saying, um, I, you know, I couldn't do that. Yes. And, and so, so this face preservation, the self preservation, is how to shield yourself from getting, you know, threats to you, mm -hmm. uh, and. and doing it to others. It's others. a, it's a dance. It's like a social dance when you speak. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's interesting and it's delicate and it's, um, and it can be done if people were just a little sensitive to that, you know? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I do. I do. Yeah. Wow. And you, you do also other things like you're, you're writing a book, for example, you've written other, other academic publications already. Right. You right. have a YouTube channel, you also yeah. podcast, <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> lot of, lot of things. Yeah, uh, I, I have this YouTube channel. I created this person called uh, Christelle Martinet mm -hmm. because I was angry with everyone at the university. I was fighting with everybody and I said, stop. Now I'm going to have fun. I'm going to do things that I like. Mm -hmm. And so I come from a generation of, you know, uh, uh, of uh, psychics. My mother was psychic. She was a card reader and her mother was a card reader and her mother was a card reader. And that's, so I started reading cards on the, on YouTube as a game, as a game. Mm. And my father also had a lot of uh, uh, experience with psychic mediumship, right? Mm. So, and that just grew and grew and grew and grew. And um, then that 
became of a small business and a, a sort of a hobby as well. Yeah. But um, one of my most, one of the most important things I think that people come to me for is, is the mediumship. They want to talk to their loved ones who have passed. And so mm. that is the biggest part of my work in that business. Yeah. Um, so, so that's how that started. And the podcasting uh, came up because <laughs> I actually, uh, well, I was working with this woman who was a consultant and she was telling me how things work in the United States because I had never published in the United States uh, a, a, a work, a nonfiction. Mm. And she said, look, every now and then you have this beautiful way of writing, but every now and then you turn a corner and you become that professor and it just changed the style. Yeah. Why don't you read it out loud? Read it out loud because I heard you in, in YouTube. So I started a podcast called uh, Pleasure Seeking because mm -hmm. the name of the book is The Magic of Pleasure Seeking. I swear to you, Toby, I swear mm -hmm. my first few episodes were done lying in bed with my phone and talking just talking. Wow. And then, wow. Yeah, that's awesome. I know, just that's talking. awesome. And then I started reading chapters of the book and that's how it started. So mm. then I started branching off and I thought, well, let me call it multiple voices like my company in the United mm. States. Mm. And uh, because this way I can talk about politics, power, you know, uh, any kind of, you know, empowerment and yes, yes. Uh, sex, <laughs> you know, anything. Mm. And yes. so, so that's how it started. But, but, um, what what is interesting is that every person who who you speak to mm. is a different story mm. and i love the stories i just love to listen to the stories mm. to people's stories yeah yes that's yeah. awesome i also love that so i love listening to people's story like yours also yeah. right now for example and everything you experience as an interpreter too i was I've been fascinated by listening to the story and even wanting to know more, but yeah. I have other questions to ask you and we have so much limited okay. time that okay, I have okay, to just move okay. on. Yeah, All right, so, go. So I would love to know about the book, actually. I would love to know about okay. the magic of pleasure seeking. What inspired okay. you to, to write this book? And, you know, we were talking about, <laughs> about chapter two, chapter two before we started the goddess. But before we start, let's just start with, you know, the inspiration behind the book. Okay. Um, what I started, um, I had a, a project in, in, you know, because we do, we, we do research as professors and my area of study is power and ideology and power in every different form. Okay. Because I generally work in with politics and ideology in the broad sense, how people think. Okay. So I study oral texts, written, all of that kind. And I started looking at American TV series. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in, and, and the ones that I was watching for my own pleasure were ones that were in Washington, DC, were in CIA, the CIA, you know, were places that I had seen that I have been to. So of course I watched them. And I started mm -hmm. noticing the female characters and my my original project was women of power for for the academic field and i started looking at a different C tv series and studying the language and i'm a social linguist so that means i i study the language in the context so i had mm -hmm. to study you know for for example um there was a tv series called scandal mm -hmm. i think it was translated in, in many different languages and it yeah. was um there was the main character called olivia pope yes. she was a fixer she was a a uh, um, an, a, um, a lawyer yes. and she had her own company and she would work with high powered uh, professionals and politicians. Yes. And it, it was so interesting to see because there, there was not always only the fact of being a woman, mm. the race issue, uh, uh, her, her family, mm. she came, she was black, but she went to Cambridge University. So she was different, you know, and that's the, the way people interacted with her sometimes when they wanted to criticize her were was amazing, you know, so I started like that. Then yes. I went to the CIA, there was another TV series called Homeland, where the female uh, protagonist was an agent that was sent always abroad because she was brilliant. She was dynamic, mm -hmm. but she had bipolarity. She was bipolar. And I thought that was so odd. How is it? And I thought to myself, you always see bipolarity in women in these shows, but not in men. 
And so then I, you know, that was another study I did. And so I put them together and I put the notes together and that's how women of power, the idea started. But in the United States, it took on the, the, um, the title pleasure seeking, the magic of pleasure seeking, because there was a twist. I changed the idea around mm. each of these women to me corresponded to an archetype. For example, this uh, Olivia Pope in Washington was a fixer. Mm, okay, yes, yes. and uh, the the bipolar the, her name was Carrie in the Homeland TV series. Mm. She was an agent, you know, an, a, a secret agent. We could have called her. So that was a different archetype. Yeah. And I grouped them all together in different parts of the book. Mm. That then changed, and I thought, let me use this as a message to women because we've got to change these dynamics okay yes. because if i study social linguistics and i study hegemonia power and ideology i have to use my writing to start changing things so i yes. wanted to talk to millennial women mm -hmm. and that's 25 the 35 25 40 things like that and the idea is they're struggling they're mm -hmm. the children of baby boomers who mm -hmm. They criticize. They saw their parents working nonstop. They saw their parents doing certain things, buying homes, getting the car, always trying to make more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And what happens is this is I'm generalizing now. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is, despite all of their criticism, they now are high powered people trying to get a high powered job. They want the family. They want children. They want the car, the house, everything. Mm -hmm. And they're suffering just as much. Why am I saying this? Because, of course, before you write a book in the United States, you have to motivate. Why are you writing this book for that target? Yes. I found that um, there was a high number of uh, depression case cases in the millennial, millennial women cohort in that mm. group. Yes. And yes. Um, But these women are also the women who are ready to just you know, wash their hands of what they've been doing and go to the Himalayas or go off to a mountain retreat and change their life and change the nature of their business. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, that's what I want to get in. And I talk about archetypes such as the goddess, the queen. I talk about the fears. There are four fears that we all have. One of them is the victim. One of them is a child, you know? So we talk about that, the witch and how the witch... Um, it is linked to blood and what blood uh, uh, means for the woman. Blood is actually our power. I mean, women, most women all over the world bleed for three to seven days without dying. Yeah. I mean, that's powerful. You yeah, know, that's that really powerful. powerful. So yeah. that's how the book started. And wow. um, I'm getting it off the ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I'm having fun with it. I'm having fun with it. Yes. But I get uh, this brings me to another idea because even though the title is pleasure seeking, right? Mm -hmm. The magic yes. of pleasure seeking there, I speak about the shadow side mm -hmm. because my beliefs are, I'm not naive enough to think that the world is always beautiful and we have, you know, rose colored glasses. But if you are happy, you have to embrace what you see in the mirror because you're not always looking at something you like right? I'll That's give true. you an example. I'll give you an example. Let's say you wake up, you feel horrible. Okay. Mm. You really feel horrible. It could be maybe you slept little, maybe your, you know, your companion left you, you lost your job, anything, but you just feel terrible. You walk around the house, you walk outside and you start looking at yourself in store windows. When you get back home, you cross the mirror, you look at yourself and you look and you're so surprised that you don't look that bad because you felt so bad. But then when you see yourself, God, I look pretty good. And yeah. isn't it funny how your mood changes so fast mm -hmm. when your mirror says, come on, lady, you don't look that bad. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's true. And so, yeah, so, yeah. so, so it's, it's, you know, this, this inside and the outside, uh, that game that, that we play with ourselves. And you really need to embrace that. You really need to, those days that that shadow side through the mirror comes and gets you. You really mm. have to look out for it and know that you're prone to do that. Yes. And how far will you go before you get out of that? Because mm. then you cannot be happy. Otherwise you won't be able to, to yeah. be 
you know, uh, uh, pleasant or joyful or happy. Yes. Um, and another thing that um, you're, as I speak, it's made me think of it. Um, in my um, studio, uh, you can see it because we're looking at each other. Your audience may not. Yes. My floor is checkered black and white. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, one day I lost something. It was the bottle top, a, a cap of a bottle. Mm. And I just couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't find it anywhere. I thought, okay, I'm getting old. You lose things. Okay. Forget it. It'll <laughs> pop up. Right. Yes. My mother always used to say, look, your house does not rob, but your house just hides things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I, yeah. one day I was lying on my couch and I was looking and I was working, you know, I had my iPad, I was writing, looking at and I looked at one of the mirrors that I have. I have these locker, gym locker, like, uh, um, yes. like closets, mm -hmm. and they have mirrors. And I was looking over to the side at, at an angle. And I saw the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. And I saw the bottle cap. Oh, it was under a chair. And oh. it was white. And it was on the white tile. And it made me because I thought to myself, you mean I didn't even clean it over there? I didn't vacuum it? <laughs> and I was laughing and laughing and laughing. Yeah. I hadn't seen it because it was white, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that means to me, you know, if I looked in a different way in that mirror at another angle, I would have seen something different. Yeah. You know, all you have to do is shift a little bit and you see your, your perspective changes, hmm. you know? And if you look, if you take your camera in, in Zoom and you raise it, you have a different person. You may of look course. better. You may look worse. You put it underneath, you know, look very scary. You never yeah. know. So this, this idea of mirror really is important mm. because it, it gives us clarity. Yes. It, uh, it does really give us clarity. Yes, but and I, it's I, frightening. <laughs> that, that, that's true. That's very right. That, oh. And that's one question I want to ask right, right now. Like, how do we deal with, you know, with the, with the magnitude of that, our sh shadow side? Like, you know, it could be frightening sometimes, it could be pleasing sometimes. How do we deal with, you know, our shadow side and the notions of visibility, like you made mention of, you know, with the mirrors in your room to be able to find the, the cup of the bottle. How do you deal with the notions of visibility and invisibility in relation to our yes. perspectives? Yes, okay, interesting. All right, you bring up visibility and invisibility. This is one part I, I clarify uh, very, very clearly. I'm very clear with this. The, the, the idea of... Um, invisibility and visibility is, of course, what you can see, all right? Mm -hmm. Of course, yes. because our sight doesn't allow us to see things, and sometimes it does. But if you carry that idea away from what the sight means and mm -hmm. put it into a social context, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the shadow now, right? You're working you're at an office, you're working in an office, there are five people in the office, and there are two positions that come up in that office, in that company. Yeah. And there are two out of the five that are interested in that position. Mm. You're friends, but when you find out that you both want it, something changes, something mm. changes. Okay. One is a man, one is a woman, let's say, just for example, sake. when you have conversation this has to do with power right when you have conversation i say to you okay uh, toby look let's let's say that today let's play a game all right let's play a game i'm going to say a word and then you 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 give me a word and then, then i have to add it so we have to make a message we have to create a, a, a phrase or a concept yeah. it's like uh, we used to play when we were young you know uh, uh, telephone right mm. and this is a game that you play with someone to have fun but also to be linked very very closely because without that other person i couldn't finish my thoughts mm -hmm. and you have to understand uh, you can't second guess the other person because they could say something completely different right mm -hmm. now that is a game that you can play socially but sometimes you want to be visible, you want to shine, mm. and that is a power that you have. But power also comes from knowing when to step back and letting the other person shine. That's visibility and invisibility. 
power structures work in a way that we don't expect. Um, remember I spoke about the direct threats. You mm. said, you know, mm. um, that is called face threatening, okay? And then there's a way of distancing yourself using passive language. Power comes never when you directly threat, ever, ever. Because the language there is distance and there's proximity. It's a complex um, algorithm that I've worked on, but the way you use your language will allow you to move closer, move farther away, to get more followers or to lose power and lose followers. Yeah. And when you talk about a shadow, how can you embrace that? When you're really, really down and you know there's something out there, all you have to do is step back. You step back and you look at it for yeah. what it is not in relation to you, but yeah. objectively and what it means to you. Because if you understand why it has some pull over you. Why is it bringing you down? Mm -hmm. If you can see that, you, it'll make you laugh. Just the way I was laughing when I was on my couch looking at the mirror and I saw the bottle cap on the white tile. Mm -hmm. And I started laughing because all of a sudden it was, you know, it wasn't the crazy woman who, you know, couldn't, who lost her memory. Mm -hmm. It was just perspective, you know, it's just perspective. So mm -hmm. it's the way you look at that shadow. Um, and, and you embrace it. You can embrace it then. Mm -hmm. It happens. I mean, we, we know life is life yes. and not every day is the same. Mm -hmm. But if you can say, okay, today's a good day. Great. Today's not so good. Oh, well, let's, I'll go have some ice cream. You know, <laughs> you know, that'll change my mood or, or, or to have some chocolate. I'm surely to, you know, pop out of my mood. You know, yeah. it's, it's something you have to bring with you. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's part of you. It's not something you can cancel. It's part of your life, you know? It's part mm -hmm. of your scars if you're, you know, if you're, you, you, if someone has hurt you, it's a scar, but that's mm -hmm. part of who you are, you know? Yes. And that's yeah. where we, you know, embrace and dance with our shadow and also Dancing, enjoy it. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dancing with it. That's the great metaphor. Yeah. Yes. Wow. And how does, you know, power, like you mentioned earlier, how does it, you know, influence our relationships with other people also, like in our, for example, um, people close to us, for example, or, you know, people around us, how does power that we have as, um, influence the relationship we have with them? Okay. Well, it, it for me, you know, I, I, having studied it, I always say, well, power is everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so it can be everything and it's hidden everywhere. Um, let me, let me say this. Um, l let's say that there's one thing that's called game theory, games, playing games. Yes. Game theory. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially, it means this. You don't want to win when you're playing, mm -hmm. especially in a relationships. It could yes. be a romantic relationship, a business relationship, a partnership, a family member. You never want to win. Otherwise, you lose mm -hmm. because then there's no relationship, you know? Yeah, yes. Okay. So, so you play the game and that goes, that's linked to the idea of visibility and invisibility. You play the game so you can continue to play the game. Yeah. And in a partnership, in a romantic partnership, that's very clear. Well, it's not as clear as I think, but to me, it's very clear because people have to win. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's even on this side, if we're not winning and we give them the, the, the uh, theater and the limelight and yeah. uh, their moment of glory, mm. we are watching a show and it's, and it's pleasant for us as well. So mm. we, it's a win-win situation. But game theory tells, uh, talks to us about how to keep the ball rolling and power is influential in that. So uh, unless we're talking about uh, countries where there are, there's absolute a, a power where there is no negotiation mm. but in in human relationships that's the game that for me that's the game it is always a matter it's a dynamic it's a dynamic equilibrium you know mm. uh, balance is always dynamic sometimes it goes up and down yeah. and to keep the game going you ha it has to be dynamic i have mm. to be sad and you have to be happy and mm. then you have to be sad and i have to that's how relationships are yeah. and how humans work mm. and um of course there are many people though that would like to have a huge audience 
and be so powerful that they can influence everyone's lives. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are very many people because they are very, um, they're very good at using their language Mm -hmm. and behind their words, there are emotions. Mm -hmm. And when you've got that very strong uh, ability, those strong ingredients together, they become powerful speakers. Mm. Um, and you know, every now and then they may even make you laugh, you know? (laughs) So, so, you know, that's how, how the relations, I believe that power is all around and uh, the game is not to win. Mm. That's the game, I think. And maybe president Trump could have understood that he probably, you know, would have had a different outcome. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's possible. That's very possible. (laughs) He wasn't playing the game, right? (laughs) And one thing I find very interesting about you again is, you know, you're a psychic medium. Mm. So, so for so, for someone out there who doesn't know about about it, can you yeah, talk to okay. me about psychic world and med- mediumship? What does that mean? What's uh, that all about? Okay. Um. All right. So, so let's say that I'm thinking, right, mm. and I'm looking at you, and you're not thinking, I mean, I could see what you're thinking and where you're getting at, you know, and I'm thinking, yes, he does want me to say something that's relevant to his audience, mm. but so he could relax and he doesn't have to talk, you know, <laughs> so that's what, <laughs> okay. So that means I'm, li- I'm reading your mind, right? Yeah, but everybody yes. does that because mm. if you talk to me, mm. you have to think a little bit ahead. And while I'm talking, you're already thinking a little ahead mm. in terms of, what you could say after that, if we're having a conversation. So everybody is a little bit intuitive. That's another word, yeah. intuitive. Yeah. But for mediumship, uh, let's say, well, the psychic has it more refined mm-hmm. and more sensitive. Uh, for example, if you came to me, Toby, and you said, look, I'm, I, I have this, um, I've had these job offers, okay? Company A, company B, company C. Mm-hmm. Company A da, is called, well, I'll call it A, B, and C. And, um, but I really am having trouble choosing. What Can you give me any insight on that? And of course, you know, while we're talking, I get it right away. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to say it's, it's going to be A, because B and C will give you other things. But for today, it's yeah. going to be A, because it'll get you then to a place where you can change your your uh, you know objectives mm. uh, and that that's a, a way of um not foreseeing the future yeah. but understanding how um how energy can move mm. because we're talking about thoughts we're talking about the way ideas yes. and those are that's energy mm. now mediumship means that a person has the spirit world Mm. people who have passed what even people who are still alive i can channel for someone else i wouldn't do it unless i had the permission of that other person if they are alive but if they are are dead if they have passed Mm. uh typically the um typically it's let's say 80 percent 85 percent of the p clients that come to me want to talk to a relative or a loved one who have passed and very recently i've been receiving a lot of um, cases for um, either suicide or uh, which is so sad very young people and mm-hmm. and covid deaths and it's mm-hmm. increasing because perhaps they there was no closure they wouldn't they weren't able to go to the hospital to, to stay with them. And, um, and what happens is they ask questions and I get the messages and I relay them to them. Mm. And it's usually a little slow in the language. It's, it's slower, but it comes out. And what's interesting about it is that I, I tell them things that I could never know. I could never know where the will was in what closet or what you know what had happened one when they were in the hospital i couldn't know that yeah. or the way they called this person when they were alive you know yeah. so a lot of the times it's very uh, i i like to do this i like to do this even if i'm exposed to negative energy i do ha- i come into contact with a lot of a negative energy i have to be very careful yeah. i have to cleanse myself up before after but what's interesting is that 
people are able to connect. Yeah. And I see that it's so important. It's so important. They, mm. You really have to connect with, you have to know that there, there's a way to do that. Mm. Um, I mean, there are more spirits than, than humans on earth uh, mm. flying around, you know? That's true. But That's yeah, true. So it's that, fascinating. Wow. Mm. Well, does that have to do with anything spiritual or it's just like, uh, like you said, just energy and that's just all about it? Well, let's say that um, the, the word spiritual has different meanings for different people. Mm. Uh, if I say to you, Toby, I'm very religious, you understand that to mean that I have a certain institutionalized religion, I'm Catholic or Jewish or Muslim, mm -hmm. and I have certain practices. Okay, so you get that. Yes. But if I say I'm a very spiritual person, you would not even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> True. And so usually the next question would be, well, well in what way, mm -hmm. you know? And yes. so that it depends, you know, one person would say to you, I contact my guides, my spirit guides often, and I pray to certain lords or whatever, according to their culture, mm. without going to the temple. Sometimes mm. they can go to a temple and so on. So, but being a, a spiritual uh, being or acting in a spiritual way for other people may also mean uh, extending yourself to help others without profit, without, uh, uh, well, unconditionally. Yeah. Be, it's, it's about love. It's mm. really about extending love. And, um, and spirituality for me is love. Mm. And uh, your spiritual essence to me is the love I see when I see someone. Yeah. A lot of people call that light. And, and that's a metaphor. It's the same, you know, for me. Um, the, the, a lot of people, they talk about the soul and how their soul, boy, you have a beautiful soul, you know, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people, if you've asked them, well, what is the soul for you here again? Where is it? I mean, if you look at you, you can't point to the soul anywhere, you know, yeah, and, true. but, but the body is nothing without a soul, you true. know, it's usually true. the soul with a body around it, you know? True. So a lot of people call it consciousness. A lot of people you call it different things. So let's say that it shifts according to the culture that you're in today or uh, where you grew up. And so it's very different, but there is, of course, the concept, whether you are alive mm -hmm. and you can talk to me or yeah. you are dead and you're no longer here. Mm -hmm. And if I speak to that soul who's no longer alive, that is a spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and not because I do that I'm spiritual, but that is a spirit because they're not human. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, so it is, it's, it's a difficult, it's very slippery. Uh, you know, it's slippery and slidey, the idea of soul, <laughs> spirituality, and what is the spirit. Somebody, uh, a lot of people talk about the soul and spirit as being the same. I, you know, don't I embrace that because I have my soul. Mm. Spirit may be my spirit guides. I know who my spirit guides are. I have all their names. I can talk to them. I talk to them every single minute of the day when I need help, you know, mm -hmm. and um so, so I, and, and that's interesting too. I also do spirit guide readings. I find the, the, the guides that people have and actually the way they want to, to impulse the people and how they uh, show themselves and yeah. how they, you know, uh, what their role is in, in their, um, for the person on yeah. their team. Yeah. And so that's really fascinating as well. But there's a lot, one last thing um, about this, and um, I want to link it to the notion of thoughts, mm -hmm. is that we all have to be very, very careful about what we think mm -hmm. and how we think, because it flies right off us. And with COVID, what we're getting and what I'm seeing, usually, I could say, look, um, Toby, after I study your profile, yes. I create a protocol and I say, look, Toby, uh, to Toby, I see this, 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 and this, this has come from this person. This has come, this is ancestral. This is today. That's not the case. It's changed. People are carriers. I could be a carrier for negative energy that I'm giving to you right now, for example, mm. but I it didn't, it didn't originate with me because the energy in the dynamics of the energy has changed so much. And that's why it, it, it's a time that's so changeable mm. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to get your bearings sometime here too. It's almost like the shadow. You have mm -hmm. to embrace it. This is what we're going through. That's the way it is. Just, you know, clean, go take a shower, <laughs> put, some, <laughs> put some perfume in the air. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and Very just, challenging. Just live with it. Yes. So yeah. from, from everything you've experienced so far, I've, I've learned a lot already, like, you know, from your days as an interpreter and, you know, as from your book that you're still writing now and also from your, you know, um, psychic mediumship also. Like, what was the most interesting experience that you've ever had? Like, from this, your interesting life already, what's the most interesting experience you've ever had? Oh, God, let's see. Um, I, I want to say so many things. I, I, I Childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. why I say that why I say that because you know even then I was writing books and everything and I got pregnant and I thought okay and you go into the hospital and you take all of these pre pre pregnancy courses mm. but when you're there and you've got to have it it's like an animal you are like an animal you take mm. it rid of all of the other things and it yeah. comes out and then I felt like a cow feeding mm. the child I mean I felt I didn't, it, I, I, I wasn't ready for it the first time. <laughs> that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that's it. But I think my um, most interesting experiences is now through the podcasting mm. um, and learning so much about other people and yes. the, the wonderful conversations. Mm. I think that that is the most rewarding. It's, it's rewarding. And what I like about it, it has nothing to do with monetary value or mm. it's nothing. It's just, it enriches you so much though yeah, you know yes yes, yes that's that awesome. for me is interesting yes. and networking today with podcasting and anything you do mm -hmm. the feeling that you're part of other people mm -hmm. is so so wonderful mm -hmm. it's amazing that's it's true. amazing that's true yeah that's that's yeah that's really good yes i'm also yeah. i'm also enjoying that you know the power of podcasting and networking yeah yeah, yeah. I, can, yes, I imagine yes so you know earlier you made mention of you know um people carrying negative energy for example or positive yes. energy and these ancestral yeah. issues for example like yeah just, just as a second to the last question um sure sure people people that are having for example psychological issues or this kind of you know negative energy issues for example how can they resolve this? How can they get through? Okay. Um, of course, everyone will tell you again, someone, something different from yeah. my perspective, from my mirror, you know, from my, where I'm looking yes. and the, and from my expertise, mm. I find that a lot of mental illness is caused by some form of negative energy that has been with the person, not only in this lifetime, but for past many past lives mm. that's and i'm saying this i'm not saying that um all mental illness is linked to negative energy no mm. but mm, i would tend to think so and mm. unfortunately when it's not uh resolved it carries over it carries continually forward mm. um I would love, I'm the first one to say, God, if you give me a happy pill, I'll be good for the rest of my life. You know, yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. if you have mental illness, sure, take anything you want. You know, when I was down, I was really, there was a time when I was so, so down and all I wanted was a pill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would laugh. I'd go to, to this doctor and say, can't you just give me a pill to make me happy? I'm so depressed now, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I would be laughing, but it was, it, it was a funny kind of uh, uh, thing to ask. But I can understand that there is, especially today, so many drugs that can do anything for you, <laughs> I mean, yeah, really. Yeah, yes. But um, but I think that that uh, the issue of your mental um, health mm -hmm. is just that it's health and health is made up of everything. Yes. And health is linked, strictly linked with social, your social life. Yeah. And you're the way you live. Mm -hmm. They cannot be brought apart. Um, it, it is, you know, the, a human is a social animal, whether we like it or not. Mm. We are, we come from people. We come, we pop out of people. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes, so, so yes. that's our first, you know, our first contact. And, 
Uh, and then, of course, people start thinking, oh, my parents, oh, why? You know, and, and there's a time when you just leave that link behind. You can't uh, blame your parents for everything. You know? <laughs> but um, yeah, I, 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 the mel- mental illness is always you know, a, a big question mark. I do believe that um, it was misunderstood for many, many years. It has, it still is misunderstood. Mm-hmm. And, and every day, I, I hope that in the future, it will be, people will be more sensitive to energy, uh, the importance of energy that yeah. uh, a person has mm-hmm. and open to non-medical uh, careers. I'm a medical intuitive. That means that um, I study different organs and systems of the body to see where there's the accumulation of negative energy yeah. and when to clear it, because mm. if you keep it, then you will get very physically ill. Mm. And that is also fascinating. Um, but, but it needs, you know, I think the, the hard scientists, the hard sciences really need to open to things that cannot be solved by just measuring it. Yeah. It doesn't work, you know. Um, there, there was a, a friend of mine who's um, uh, uh, who is a, a physicist, and um, he said, you know, he's a, an experimental physicist, and he said, um, in our experiments, when we try to measure the origin of time, mm-hmm. we get there, and as soon as we think we've measured it, it shifts, mm-hmm. and it keeps moving. You know, yeah. and that that just goes to tell you that's the hard. You can't get harder than science than that's than true. physics. You know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So you mean for, for us to you know resolve all of these psychological issues, we should look into some things that are not you know medical. Exactly. Or, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and not go late. Go early mm. on. Go early on, especially yeah. when you re- you realize there are certain patterns Let me give you a couple of examples um you're a 35 year old man or woman mm-hmm. and you realize that you've had the same pattern recur mm-hmm. you meet a partner you stay together for four months and it's over mm-hmm. after the fourth month it's, it never goes forward mm-hmm. because there's something that occurs and you start then you start to think what's happening you know, it has to be me because I'm the only one who's has been, has this, you know, and that's when people come to me to think I, I can't get out of this rut. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Yeah, yeah. And so then we work through the past lives, we work through the uh, energy and, mm. and there's you always a shift and always, always a shift. That's fast. That is uh, one of, I work with um, uh, soul therapy, I call it. And of all the research I've ever done, this is the most fascinating for me because I see the results. And um, it's just a remarkable how changes come about. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's, I work with a lot of uh, women who uh, have typically, who typically come from society where their voices are not heard or where they are constrained to the family ties when they have to get married at an age, you know, under the age of 30, where they have, you know, all of these constraints. And, um, and when they work with me, even if they're no longer 35, they're 50, Mm -hmm. and have been married for 20 years or 30 years. After this soul therapy, they find themselves turning to their partner and saying, uh, look, it's about time we stop doing this. We need to do that. I can no longer live like that. Whereas they would have never started saying any of that before. Mm-hmm. And that that's one of the, the things that I have seen. I've myself have, has, have gone through it. That's why I started uh, uh, this years ago uh, doing it because I realized that it's all about your thoughts. It mm. really is uh, all about your thoughts. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not, you know, I really do like to look at the dark side. I mean, who doesn't like to dance in those shadows? Come on, go down. There's that song, um, uh, Take a Walk on the Wild Side, this old, mm. uh, <laughs> this old song. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you go on the wild side and that's where you have fun actually. You know, do things you're not supposed to do, break the law, you know, let me break the law. And then you have fun. And then just because you're breaking the law and then you come back the next day, you go to work, you know? Uh, so there are those sides that we need to dance in, you know? Yeah, yes. 
So for someone out there who's interested to work with you, for example, what's the best way to connect and work with you or to get to read more about your um, academic publications, to get to know more about your services, to maybe okay. watch your- Okay, there's your, some, yeah, yeah well, I'll, I'll uh, give them to you right to, there's a, um, uh, my, there my two websites, my mm. author and voice coach website is uh, www.claudiamonicelli.com. And the other services where I work with energy is um, www.christelmartinet.com. Mm. And my YouTube channel, uh, Claudia Monicelli, AKA yeah. Christelle Martinet, um, you'll be able to find me, get to, and the publications, there's, I'll give you a link to um, Google Scholars uh, where there's all of my, there are all of my publications there. Oh, usually, awesome. probably. <laughs> that, that's awesome thank you so, thank so you much so, uh, thank you toby you <laughs> it was such a pleasant conversation thank you so much for having me i appreciate it same here thank you so much for everything you, you taught me and everything i was able to learn from you i really appreciate <laughs> it thank you so much